Welcome to the second of a three event conference series toward an anti-racist art ecosystem. I'm Melissa Tenney, president of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and we are proud to continue this dialogue at this still pivotal time. Though we have more tools to protect ourselves against the pandemic than we did when this conversation series began, the ingrained inequalities highlighted and exacerbated by the global health crisis persist. In nearly every field, those who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color experience systemic impediments often resulting in professional and economic marginalization. The Toward an Anti-Racist Art Ecosystem Conference Series recognizes that this manifestation of racism is built into the art world as it exists today, and Marshall's faith that these inequities could be unbuilt from the art world we can bring forth tomorrow. The first session in this series held online in April focused on the art and design ecosystem in Chicago. And the final event taking place in spring 2022 will take an international look at the field. Today's event takes a national frame and I'm excited we're able to welcome today's exceptional leaders for this provocative and important conversation. This event would not be possible without our friends and partners at Hinman Auctions, who've not only underwritten this conference series, but had the original inspiration for its scope, focus, and duration. On behalf of SAIC, please accept my sincere thank you. I also want to thank everyone at SAIC who worked to mobilize Hinman's generosity into the program you'll see today, and all of the guests and panelists who we'll hear from today. And finally, I'd like to thank and welcome the moderator for today's event, Sampada Aranki. Dr. Aranki is an assistant professor in the Art History, Theory, and Criticism Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her research interests include performance theories of embodiment, visual culture, and Black cultural and aesthetic theory. Her writing has been published in numerous magazines and journals, including Art Forum and October, and received a 2021 Art Journal Award. She's written catalog essays for artists such as Sadie Barnett, Rashid Johnson, and Faith Ringgold. And she's currently working on her book manuscript entitled Death's Futurity, The Visual Life of Black Power. Please welcome Professor Sampada Aranki. Thank you all for joining us this evening and to Alyssa, Delinda, and Jefferson for gathering us. I also want to thank Jeff, Marissa, and Emily for their tireless support in making this event happen. I just want to offer up some housekeeping notes to get us started. We plan on having ample time for conversation. Please use the Q&A function to contribute questions to our fantastic panelists. Now some notes on framing. Today's event is one of three parts that are organized around questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion within arts institutions, networks, and systems. The first event, which took place last spring, focused on Chicago. Tonight, we will broaden out the scope by offering up perspectives from incredible cultural workers from around the country. In a preliminary planning session with our contributors, the notion of responsibility came up as a central motivating and probing theme across everyone's disparate positions and interests. It is in that same spirit of responsibility that we convene tonight. As a way to focus our energies, I have asked each panelist to respond to the prompt of sharing one unnamed and one named element that they have encountered in their work that touches upon anti-racism within an art ecosystem. This idea of the named and unnamed thing came from a desire to be able to turn back time. I've recently been thinking about the oft-cited trope of what I would tell my younger self about the academic and artistic systems I've learned about and from as an adult. Unnamed things can be elements that we've accepted or that we've inherited that we wish we would have known 
and named in order to be able to better question, destabilize, or dismantle these systems that we live and work in. Conversely, named things might include elements to recall, pieces of advice to absorb, or sources of energy that adhere us to the kind of work we do. Our speakers today will briefly offer up one unnamed and one named thing that corresponds to the question or role of responsibility as artists and cultural workers in the field. Now, it is my pleasure to briefly introduce each speaker in the order they will present. I will introduce everyone at once and then turn it over to our speakers who will seamlessly present in succession. Um, and that will be in alphabetical order. After our final presentation, we will move to a discussion between our panelists and then move to questions from all of you out there in the ether. Our first presenter is Brendan Fernandez. Brendan Fernandez is an internationally recognized Canadian artist working at the intersection of dance and visual arts. Currently based out of Chicago, Brendan's projects address issues of race, queer culture, migration, protest, and other forms of collective movement. His projects have been, show been shown at the 2019 Whitney Biennial, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Getty Museum, the National Gallery of Canada, and MAC in Montreal, among a great many others. He is currently artist in residency and assistant professor at Northwestern University and represented by Monique Maloche Gallery in Chicago. After Brendan, we have Dina Hagag. Dina Hagag is a program officer in arts and culture at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Prior to her position at the Mellon Foundation, she was the president and CEO of United States Artists from 2017 to 2021, a national arts funding organization based in Chicago. And before that, she was executive director of the Contemporary from 2013 to 2017, a nomadic and non-collecting art museum in Baltimore. She is on the board of the Underground Museum, as well as the Artistic Directors Council of Prospect 5, an advisory council of Recess. Among others, she was most recently named a 2020 YBCA 100 honoree. Following Dina, we have Allison Glenn. Allison Glenn is a curator and writer deeply invested in working closely with artists to develop ideas, artworks and ex exhibitions that respond to and transform our understanding of the world. Glenn is Senior Curator and Director of Public Art at the Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston. Some of her many acclaimed exhibitions include Promise, Witness, Remembrance, an exhibition that reflected on the life of Breonna Taylor, centered on her portrait painted by Amy Sherald, Color Field in 2019, an outdoor sculpture exhibition that activated a contemporary gallery at the lush North Forest with works by 11 sculptors, and Out of Easy Reach, which was on view simultaneously at DePaul Art Museum, Stony Island Arts Bank and Gallery, and Gallery 400 rather here in Chicago. She received dual master's degrees from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in modern art history, theory, and criticism, and arts administration and policy. And then following Allison, we have Nancy Marie Miflo. Nancy Marie Miflo is a professor of gender studies and serves on the faculty advisory committee for American, uh, American Indian studies. She is a scholar of race and representation with an emphasis on comparative global indigeneity movements in the arts. Mythlo's training as a cultural anthropologist informs how she examines cultural, institutional, and political systems that often mask the normalization of bias in contested realms of power. Her curatorial work has resulted in nine ex exhibits at the Venice Biennial. Her most recent books include Knowing Native Arts from University of Nebraska Press, and Making History, IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts from the University of New Mexico Press. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Brandon Fernandez. 
Uh, thank you so much, Sampada, um, and so much, uh, so grateful to be part of this, this conversation and to be here to uh, create dialogue uh, with everyone else. Um, so I'm um, gonna continue with my first slide, um, which, you know, my unnamed was in this world, there's a sense that we are working towards equality. And I feel that, you know, when I say this world, I'm talking about the greater, larger space that we live in, but also the art world. And within this, I'm showing a work of art that I've made and I'll kind of uh, contextualize it through the space um, of this work, uh, but then kind of give some ideas, uh, put ideas forward that we can think and talk through. Um, this piece is called On Flashing Lights and it, and it sort of speaks, it's from 2018 and it speaks about queer communities in Toronto where my, I'm originally from, I've lived in uh, Chicago for many years and in the United States, but from Toronto, um, the queer community was having issues with visibility, so support and being taken care of by um, by the police. So police abolition was something that I've always been thinking about. And for me, um, this piece uh, speaks to this idea of collectivity, the idea that, you know, we need to find solidarity within our spaces of existence. Um, so we still live in fracture. This idea of equality is still something that we're working towards. Um, so even speaking as a dance maker, this, this, this language of, of movement that we need to move towards and to find this solidarity. So I feel that in this unnamed, we're working against each other at times under the capitalist guise um, where, you know, even sometimes POCs, queers are kind of coming against each other to create those fractures, those binaries. And to find that solidarity, I feel that we need to work together to kind of find that equality. So I still feel like we need to define that space. Um, in this piece, I, I gathered uh, 24 police uh, cars down the street uh, uh, across uh, facing city hall. And I asked queer DJs to come and play music. And then we gathered people to come and dance on the streets to kind of come in a critical mass to, to create um, this moment, you know, in this sort of joyous kind of freeing that we are creating a space of inclusivity, solidarity. Um, and so I think that, you know, in the space of equality, this unnamed space, we need to dis dismantle um, social construction, social systems that have created, um, you know, the world that we're living in. So dismantling mean, you know, to 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 find change, to find um, ideas of being visible, because I have feel, felt that, you know, in the space of equality, I am not always seen, I am not always heard. And for me, that is something that I'm kind of questioning a lot in my work as I'm moving towards, you know, um, finding this, this, this notion of, of inclusivity through what I'm going to be calling a queer space in my next slide. So we can move forward to the next slide. Um, so the name, the work is never done, and we continue to find ways to be visible. So the idea that, you know, I may not be heard or I may not be seen is a space of, you know, the kind of unnamed, but in that I'm also saying that eventually I don't want to be always heard. I don't always want to be seen. So the, the visible to find a space where we have come to that, that moment, that space of being included um, is something that I think we need to do. So the work is, is still something that is needed. So even this conversation will start to create dialogue, will start to help us form those ideas, but we also need to take action, take action to find, you know, we can say things, but within that, I always state that we need to perform our politics, that those, you know, saying one thing, dismantling in terms of words, um, suggest something, but there needs to be action. And those actions need to take on new forms, new ways of existing together. And to kind of remember that those, those binaries and those fractures set us apart. And so um, this is a piece, this is my Whitney Biennial piece that also was commissioned by the Graham Foundation in Chicago, is the space of finding, you know, dancers working within apparatuses that, that seemingly support, but also burden them. And for me, there's this space that within that we can find uh, what I call freedom within restraint. So within the current situation that we're living in, how do we then move forward? If we don't move forward, it becomes a stagnant space, a space that is not, um, you know, allowing us to think and move up from where we are. And so I'm suggesting that we find the freedom from within, within our restraints. So in this piece, I'm putting the dancers into uh, precarious 
positions. But within that, I'm also asking them to find new ways to move, new ways to function. Um, and you know, our bodies are resilient. Our bodies continue to do the work, but in that resistance and resilience, how do we find change? And so I'm calling the space within my own thoughts process, a queer space, queer through, not only through um, sexual and gendered identities, but through the space of inclusivity that is, is constantly in flux, that's changing, but also asking for, for inclusivity and to be defined constantly through the process. And so the queer space also then suggests a safe space or a brave space. And so within this, the named, I want to remember that we are still working. We still have a lot of labor to endure through, to move to this new space, to become something different. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brendan. And thank you, Sampada and SAIC for inviting us to speak tonight. My name is Allison Glenn. I am Senior Curator and Director of Public Art at the Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston. I am gonna talk about um, two different exhibitions today and we can go to the next slide. So I really felt like the things that were named and things that were unnamed hinged upon one another. So the unnamed statement for me is that curators are the authoritative voice in the museum or exhibition space. And um, I have come to a place professionally where I understand and consistently want to reinforce the things we need to name, which is that museums have many publics, including artists, communities, patrons, and more. And that calling people in is actually the curatorial work. Um, when done successfully, it has the potential to dismantle systems of power and authority. Next slide, please. So I invited Odili Donald Odita when I was uh, at Crystal Bridges um, to create a, an outdoor work as part of an exhibition called Color Field. And um, I'll ask that the audio is now played so we can hear from Odili exactly what this, this sculpture My name is, is Odili Donald Odita and I'm an artist in the exhibition Color Field, which is currently on view on the campus of the University of Houston. My work for this exhibition is titled Negative Space, which was made to address current issues in American politics, in particular the detention of migrating immigrants and the separation of their families at the U.S.-Mexican border. I must acknowledge that this issue is important to me as an immigrant myself, with my family leaving Nigeria at the start of the Biafran War for safer haven in the United States. Back then, my family was welcomed upon our arrival in America and prospered as they became very productive U.S. citizens who contributed their weight to the development of the American ideal. So it comes with great distress to see what America is doing now, which goes against some of the core principles that I thought were intrinsic to the idea of America as a land of freedom with the opportunity to prosper. There are 13 flags and 13 poles which represent the idea of the 13 founding American states at the start of its union. My flag is a facsimile of the American flag, which is also comprised of 13 stripes. The colors start on one side with red, white, and blue, then morph into the colors green, black, and orange. The second set of colors are complementary colors to the first set, acting as an opposite and contrast, which underscores the aesthetic, aesthetic notion of positive and negative space. The formal idea of negative space continues in the A-frame canopy structure of the flagpoles. The A-frame, suggestive of house and home, is also a crossroads, where the poles extend as lines into space, creating an imaginary X in their placement. In my piece, the American flag is at the center where change becomes its consideration. Can a walk through negative space inspire greater action toward the positive and a change for the better? By installing this work at Crystal Bridges, it's, it's now actually at the University of Houston, um, uh, the viewer was really implicated and that was a lot of the intention of the artist. Uh, you couldn't experience the entirety of the exhibition or the North Forest if you did not traverse the distance below the flags themselves. And that, that walking through the space was really a metaphor that, um, as I said before, we're all implicated in this larger challenge of immigration and um, citizenship. Next slide, please. I had the opportunity this year to work on an incredible exhibition at the Speed Art Museum called Promise Witness Remembrance, which was centered around the portrait of Breonna Taylor as painted by Amy Sherrill. 
Some of the early questions I had were how does curatorial work address the site of trauma? Who were the key players? And what was the project's focus and goal? And how can we keep that in focus? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, previous slide, please. The way that I was able to anchor the focus and call people into the space were through a series of committees. The first one I built was a national advisory panel. It was made up of people from across the United States, both artists and people outside of the art world who had experience with either gun violence or police brutality or both. And I, what, the reason why I built this national panel was an opportunity to decenter my voice and also stand in solidarity with all of these people when curating an exhibition in a city that is a city like Louisville that I didn't live in and had gone through quite a bit in the past year and a half. Next slide, please. Concurrent to the national panel, there were four local committees that were organized by Toya Northington and her image is on the bottom right there. The local committees gave me an opportunity to get really important on the ground critical feedback. And I spent my time kind of moving between the national panel, the steering committees, and of course, Brianna Taylor's mother, Tamika Palmer. Next slide, please. At the end of the day, Tamika's voice was the most important voice in the room. We decided to have a timeline in the exhibition. And when I presented that to her for consideration, she volunteered to write it. The decision was made to install the timeline and you can just keep rolling the slides to the end. The decision was made to install the timeline in the gallery with the portrait and to allow Tamika Palmer's voice to be the most important and anchored voice in the space. And I'm happy to talk about that later in the Q&A. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Dina Hagag and I'm a program officer for arts and culture at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I didn't prepare any images because I don't make things, but as someone who's been in philanthropy for a very long time, I um, take great pride in helping colleagues like the artists, curators and scholars on this call make things possible. So I think we can just advance to my named and unnamed. So my unnamed is that having a career in this field means you hold far more power than you think you do and that you need to act like it, which is my gentle way of saying that in my early career, I worked really, really hard to try to have a position in the art world where I felt like I could influence people who had power or that I myself would hold power. The thing I didn't quite realize is as someone who came from a position of being the underdog in the field for a long time, it really just completely shifted my view on what it means to have a practice and a career in the art world. So for me, one of the things that no one ever said to me was that the day you have a job, the moment you become a curator, the second you have a major art exhibition or publish a book, you now are on the side of power and there's a lot you need to do to reinforce um, the importance of questioning that power, of making room for people who are powerless without accidentally comparing yourself to them, which is a lifelong practice for me and something that comes up in philanthropy all the time. Um, philanthropy is uneven. We hold an exorbitant amount of wealth and power and influence. And I think one important thing philanthropy needs to do right now, even as it is fighting in many corners it is for a more just, less racist world, is we can never compare ourselves to the people on the ground actually doing the work. Because again, there is a massive power imbalance and we must act like it. Um, we can advance to my next one. My named is that this work will be fun and thrilling and my career largely has been and I have loved many, many moments of it. But one thing that has become really clear to me and one thing that many mentors tried to warn me of in the beginning is that while I love this work, it will not love me back. And that is something you really, really need to hold on to. There is nothing we can do to make this industry anti-racist enough that it will ever love any of us back. That thing is true. It is embedded in the absolute bedrock of this country. It doesn't mean we should not try. It doesn't mean we still cannot love our work and the people that it engages, but it does mean that you need to cultivate things for yourself that are outside of this field. Um, I wrote this really holding students in mind. So that's like the biggest audience I'm talking to. Um, but for other folks on the line who are in the field and working, I hope you have moments uh, for yourself that are not about this 
industry and the ways in which, again, it can never give us what we need. Um, thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Yacenta, uh, hello everyone. I'm Nancy Marie Mythlo. I am a professor of gender studies at UCLA, also affiliated with the American Indian Studies program and the interdepartmental program. Um, I am honored to be a guest on the lands of the Tonga and the Gabrielino people in the area known as Tavangar. My tribe is the Fort Sill Chiricahua Warm Springs Apache tribe. We're located both in New Mexico and in Arizona. And our history is known primarily as one of warfare. Um, we were not conquered. We surrendered in 1886 and were incarcerated for 28 years. So that when I graduated um, with my PhD from Stanford in 1993, my grandfather who was born a prisoner of war had just passed away. So these are, are very near histories, very tender histories. And I don't wanna just put this into a quick context. So if we think about how many indigenous folks there were and what we now consider to be the United States, um, you know, scholars debate whether that was 6 million, 20 million, 30 million people. Um, you know, fast forward that time when grandfather's incarcerated and it's the dip, we, I call it the nadir of 1900. And forgive me, I'm going into my professor mode here because <laughs> I've got to be quick. Um, you know, that drop in population. And now um, I think with the last census, it was 9.7 in the United States, um, Native American people who were counted. And that's up from, I think, 5.2, 10 years ago. So I, I just want to point out that there's this, um, people use resiliency and debate it. And I'd love to talk about that with our group here, but you know, there's this apocalyptic time period that indigenous folks had lived through. So we're actually you know, living in the future right now. Futurism means something very different, I think, in our context. The other context is time. So you may have heard that in Southern New Mexico, which my folks are from, um, they found footprints that were 23,000 years old, guys. Um, just go to the National Park Service White Sands and you can see that. And so we're, we're talking about a context that is the United States of America, which is less than 250 years old. And, and so you start to think about, well, indigenous wisdom, you know, indigenous ways of being, wouldn't these come in handy? I mean, not only because we've been through an apocalyptic time period, but you know, also the longevity of our cultures. And yet, sadly, I think in the arts, this still hasn't really happened yet. Uh, we're underfunded, we're underrepresented on just about every score. I've got a book out, Knowing Native Arts. I, I rant about it there. Um, but I wanna move to my first slide. So in terms of you know, how we're presenting our talks today, this is an example out of my class from last week, and it's um, American Indian Studies, it's 202 Key Theories and Concepts. I did not prompt my students to do this exercise. Um, this was their own exercise in relationship to reading. We're looking at the works of Melanie Yazzie, um, in which they define, they ask each other, and they used an app to get these answers about what is Native success and what is Western success. And as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's this idea of, culture being central of land and people and responsibilities and relationships as being central. And then the perception here of the West, which, you know, honestly, I agree with is it's about accumulating material wealth. It's about the exertion of power. And these two frameworks exist in what Vine Deloria Jr., one of our great theorists would call absolute conflict, absolute conflict. So we don't talk about this often that there is this absolute conflict when we think about how indigenous folks are moving through the world. And this does impact the arts. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I was very happy last week to have been hosting a Native American Rights Fund lawyer, Brett Shelton. And what I asked him to do was to present the idea of peacemaking. So if we've lived through thousands of years, you know, indigenous folks, we've got to have had ways, processes, of getting past disputes, right? Of being able to live collectively as a people. What is that process? Could that process be useful today? And I'll just walk through just really quickly. I wanna you know, keep to the time period here, but if you say, all right, land theft equals warfare, equals incarceration, more accurately um, for my group, political prisoners indefinitely detained, 
Um, that led to boarding schools, which are, I think, more accurately known as industrial schools. That led to the adoption, basically the child scoops, right, which led to trauma, multi-generational trauma. And so for us, the way back is to get back the things that were taken from us. And I'm really crediting Brett's work here with Indigenous peacemaking, but there's a tension. So to get those things back, we're dealing with museums, we're dealing with archives, right? We're dealing with systems of power. So if we want to become whole again, then we need to have a relationship with those institutions and the people who work at those institutions. And this is not just good for us alone. I mean, this is good for everyone because you know, we're survivors and thrivers and um, our value systems I think are, are really needed. So just quickly, the same slide, this is a Brett Shelton slide. I asked him if I could use it. I also asked my students if I could use theirs. And again, you see these different value systems between relationships and rights, having experts, and really facilitating common values through a circle system. So um, I look forward to talking with the rest of the panelists. Thank you for this invitation to contribute and I'll pass it over to Sam. Thank you all so much. There's, I feel like we can go in so many different directions. And I think maybe one place I'm interested in going is actually a, a mini conversation between Nancy and Allison um uh, specifically maybe you can start the conversation and and dina and brendan your insight in terms of working around and with communities are is also so valuable here um but i'm interested in the formalization of um of integrating experiences and voices that are outside of of your own as singular authors or singular representatives so I'll just pause to say that like what strikes me across all four of, of you is your insistence that like it's not just about you, right? That you kind of hold these positions and these positions are actually collective positions that you just happen to kind of be in, whether it be artist or program officer or curator or academic, right? Like we've kind of assigned value to these positions as like, um, about you and your individual uh, achievements. And all four of you are working so radically to like dismantle that idea. And so I'm wondering if you can maybe reflect out loud about um, how that insistence, right? To bring in um, voices outside of your own, um, specifically to organize around differences, around different communities, around different positions, how that has um, shaped or challenged your own relationship to the positions you hold. Um, because I think we, we often romanticize the kind of collective endeavors, but it's very difficult to talk about you know, carrying that responsibility and how that responsibility uh, reshapes us. So maybe you could just reflect a little bit about um, what it means to work out or to work outside of your own subject position, but also kind of the challenges of bringing in other kinds of dynamics and institutions that tend to value the kind of singular artist or the singular curator, the, you know, as, as the position of value. I know it's a big one. Allison, do you want to start? Do you want me to jump in? I was just going to ask you the same thing. Why don't you start, Nancy? And okay. I'll pick up after you after you begin. Okay, I'll, I'll just share, you know, we started out talking and thank you, Sam, for the, the prompts um, about how we got to where we are. And I think I might have shared with this group, you know, my tribal chairwoman called my father and told me I needed to work for the tribe, you know, and so I, I, I've always thought, you know, it wasn't actually a free will thing. Some people ask me, oh, how did you happen to come into this field of study? And, and it always kind of shocks me that question because I'll just say it's my responsibility to do this. You know, I was asked to do this. And so then I, I think we're talking about different frames of how people move in the world. And, and I guess, you know, I'm, I'm using the phrase like cultural competency a lot. You know, um, you know, can we just all gain in cultural competency? And while those divisions I presented actually do exist according to law, you know, there's federal law, Native people are sovereign nations within a nation. You know, our, our philosophical grounding is, is really about how do we all move forward together? 
And it will be a challenge. I'm not saying I've got like an easy answer. I don't think any of us are, but the tribal peacemaking actually is, is, has only from my understanding, primarily been used in tribal court systems. And so within communities. And so my challenge is how do you make that work outside of a distinct community? How do you bring in non-native folks and, and have that be actually a process that could be enacted? And basically, it, it, I mean, it's, it, I guess truth and reconciliation, it would be the frame that's been used in the past, but it's telling truths. And then it's being quiet and listening to everyone, right? And, and then not having an authority say what happens. And then the other part, really important, local, really local, like as specific as you can be. And, and recognizing there's multiple ways. I mean, there's 574 tribes, so there's a ton of different methodologies. Thank you, Nancy. You know, I, I wrote down something you said, which was um, being quiet and listening to everyone. And I feel like that's a really poignant statement for this kind of work of, you know, really um, engaging with multiple publics and communities and, and working to decenter yourself as you know, whether curator or uh, academic or artist or, or funder. Um, and I would say that, that that also has been a really key part of the work that I do. Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily something that came easy because I think anyone who really is moving into a space of curatorial work, you, you know, you have uh, a voice and a vision and you're interested in engaging with artists to, um, to you know, articulate a thesis. Um, and a lot of this work is public facing and public, it's a public role. And so typically, um, well, for me at least, coming to a place of being quiet and listening was actually a skill uh, that I, I'm always working to perfect, but it's something that has come with time and experience. And um, I would just say that, you know, thinking about the multiple people that are listening today, um, that's, that's what I want to answer add maybe to your question, Sam, is like the being quiet and listening is actually the most impactful. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Allison and Nancy. But like Nancy, I, I also like wrote right down right, right away this idea of being quiet and to listen to everybody. And what does that mean? You know, we talked about collective endeavors. We talked about this idea of singularity, uh, which I thought was, you know, when we talked about, when you mentioned this idea of um, Sam about singularity, I was like, you know, that for me is about kind of separating, creating like, uh, you know, distinct differences where we we come from our different experiences, but when we come down to these, these moments of like, Questions of of sites of trauma or or where we're marginalized or where we're we're, we're seen as being different or othered, it comes. It's the same thing. And I think that's something that's really important to remember that then we can come together in collectivity to find the spaces. And you know, in my in my in my words in the beginning, I said something about the questions of like you know wanting to be seen, wanting to be heard. But I think this idea of also being like you know quiet listening taking a place to give back is also important you know it, it, it plays within this public system you know we're talking about the art world we're talking about you know the institution a system such as even like you know a, a school or a museum but those systems are the systems that are the ones that have been oppressive and so within that system then how do we change um and give back, you know, because sometimes I don't necessarily feel in the academy, even though I work and live in the academy, um, that I am given the same space as others, you know, because I am also seen as a token or as an other, you know, as a queer POC. And someone who uses that as, you know, something that as an identity, a moniker uh, of who I am, uh, it can also become something that's tokenized. And I think that's something where we need to be very, um, aware and then and, and and confront that I don't know why we don't confront that you know it's something that is is needed in these systems yeah I think I can add to that that um, I think Sam to your original question about what it means to be in a space and not only be representing yourself I think oftentimes the space does that for you right and so you're a black woman in one of these rooms and you don't get to be an individual person right you become you represent lots of communities and lots of expectations and lots of assumptions. But I, but I think it's actually a, um, I think it's like a power tool. Like I, I think people are most vulnerable when they are alone and when they are isolated and when they do operate from a space of complete and utter individualism. And so I think the more that you can be in a space representing a community, the more um, potential power you can flex. 
Um, the more honest that is, the more a community will hold you accountable to the things you're saying in that room. And so I think they, they become a guide in a really real way. Um, but it feels nice to be in a room and know that there's an imaginary and or real, you know, thousand people behind me. Um, and I think to the institutions I've been in, when they would make those assumptions on my behalf in the beginning, it would frustrate me. And after a certain point, I realized that it was um, a very good tool to have in my corner. Um, and it was more about demonstrating to those assumptions that these were real people with real lived material conditions and real expectations of what they needed from institutions to live healthier lives in the art world and beyond. But I love it. I hope everyone in this room like really remembers to like keep keep people on your side, keep people in your corner, keep people in your community as you navigate the job, the many different jobs you will probably have in this field. It really does make you safer and it makes the work better. And it's the only thing that will push this community forward. Yeah. Dina, that's so, yeah. I mean, this is the kind of interesting, it, it leads me to another question that it comes up a lot for me with my students. And so I'm actually curious to know how the four of you respond to a frustration that they have, which Dina, you're touching on in terms of like, I think this is such a useful way to think about the problem of tokenization that Brendan raises and that maybe we've all experienced in these variety of ways is like the frustration that's organized around that, right? Which is like the, the obligation right, or the expectation or assumption to speak on behalf of a people or a people's, right? Um, like, how do we turn that in a different kind of way or with a, a certain kind of attention? Um, one, one kind of question that maybe I can throw out just based off of the way the conversation is moving is oftentimes my students express a frustration with, you know, on the one hand being and I'm speaking specifically to my students of color, right? Um, so on the one hand, being kind of uh, understood in relation to their racial formation and, you know, as Black artists or as, um, yeah, artists of color in various kinds of ways. And on the other hand, right, trying to make work that speaks to aesthetic concerns and formal concerns, um, and the, there's there they often speak of like a quiet or like a silence when it comes to their critique time, <laughs> right? Like it's like they they like their the critique like people don't know how to respond to their work, um, and and the, they either get lobbed with like well who's your audience because maybe you're work, making work that isn't you know directive or figurative or like directly responding to a, su a subject position or maybe you're making work that is and therefore it's not contemporary or conceptual or experimental enough and you know that which which is a code for saying like it doesn't fit a kind of white avant-garde in a certain kind of register so i'm wondering because all four of you you know just and and i should include myself here like all five of us have relative power in relation to those questions that our students express as frustrations and i'm and this is a big assumption maybe we have experienced that to different registers in our own practices right um so i'm just wondering if you could reflect on or or speak to or maybe even give some kind of insight to those struggles, right? Like what do we do as makers, um, cultural workers in the field who maybe, you know, are always trying to balance the social that's implicit in the formal and the formal that's implicit in the social and and um, what, what, how can we maybe, um, yeah, just kind of give some words to those who are struggling in that realm. Yes, Sam, I'll, I'll just jump in here. I gave a paper, um, I think it was last year, um, International Arts and Society, and it was on how artists, uh, primarily well, all Native women artists are treated in the Q&A section of these Zoom calls. 
And, and there is um, a whole host of assumptions. There are a whole host of assumptions that, that come to play. So, um, you know, questions about, I might be native, can you help me? Um, questions about like, I have never heard of this before. What does it mean? Um, you know, and then uh, an insistence that the dialogue somehow gets to a level for people who know nothing about native culture, know nothing about art. And so our artists themselves who are there to talk about modernism or about their work and painting have to get stuck in like, doing the American Indian 101 with you know, child adoption and everything else. And maybe they themselves are, have been subject to those policies, which can be really you know, distracting at the least. And, and so I, I'm starting to see how artists respond, what tools they have. And some of them are, are laughter, just you know, some of them are anger, some of them are accommodation. I mean, there's a whole toolbox of, of how we might respond to the audience not knowing, but but I see it throughout. I mean, I, I Dean, I, I really took away what you said about we we have a different power relationship um, than audiences, and obviously also as myself as a professor with students, but you know, I'm worried for our artists because I feel like they're getting beat up out there a little bit with an insistence about where the dialogue should be. And, and, and that, that could be somehow dictated from outside of the realm in which it's being produced. I can jump in. I think maybe to the example of, if I'm understanding it correctly, students of color who are in studios where people can't really critique them very well because they're just, a, I think a few things. I think that premise is so boring. I think it is so boring and I feel like, God bless white people, you get one language in this country. That's it, you are taught one vernacular, that is it. When the rest of us have had to learn a few different languages, not always well, but we've had to flex. And I think if you are a white student or faculty or administrator at an art school, unable to learn a new vernacular, we have a problem, honey, like what are you doing? So I think it is an incredibly boring premise. I don't know what advice to give students of color in that position because I don't know that it's a problem they can solve. I think it is a much larger issue. And I think that I feel bad. I feel bad for white people that can't speak to more than one thing. And I think that art school is an opportunity to open up that aperture a tiny bit and that you should seize it. And so if you are standing in a critique and you can't find something to say, you go home and you write about that feeling. You interrogate that feeling. You come out of school slightly more lingual than you came in. But it's just like, we are in 2021. How are we still having this conversation at art schools? Like it is absurd. And I do wanna say, if I can, while she's on this call, cause I don't know if I've ever said this to you, Allison, but um, the Breonna Taylor show to me was a really incredible demonstration of an artist with a curator, forgive me, with an evident community in the room with her. Because there were so many ways to want to tear that show apart, to be totally frank, too many ways to be like, but at every turn, it was clear that like at least 30 other people were in that room with you at all times and people who are so close to that thing. And I also feel like, because there's some questions already floating around, like you can tell the difference from when someone is just like cheating it and when someone is really in the room with more than one voice because they have learned to speak more than one language. And so I love all the POC kids, I think, many of you, I hope. But the white ones, like, read a book. Thank you, Dina. Um, I mean, I I went to this the school of the, the Art Institute of Chicago, and I remember hearing this in grad school, and um, I am surprised and shocked to hear that it's something that is still um, coming up in some places. And I wouldn't say that in every studio or with every artist friend of mine that was in the MFA program that this was the case, but in many cases, it was a constant. And um, yeah, I actually don't believe that. I don't believe that statement. Um, I, I think that it is, um, it's a power move. It's, it's, it's a power play to say that you can't understand somebody's work because it then basically puts them in a place where they can't do anything. They're, they're rendered um, unable to do anything because you've basically told them that what they're doing is ineffective and that, and you've positioned yourself as um, a, a, a qualifier or, or a qualifying you know, voice in the room telling someone whether what they're trying to communicate is effective or ineffective. And the irony of that is, is, is something else entirely. Um, 
But yeah, thank you, Dina, for that comment about the, the show at the Speed Museum. There were at least 30 people all the time. And I actually, I mean, I, I, that was the most feedback I've ever gotten in an exhibition. And um, I'd love to hear where and how you want to tear it apart. Um. <laughs> I don't. I'm saying the premise <laughs> of a show about trauma is too yeah. easy yes. to want to say, but that person doesn't experience that trauma or that direct trauma, that particular trauma until you're in the show and you're like, oh yeah, Allison, this was made with 30 other people. Like that trauma, like all of it is here. And I think if more curators moved in that way, like shows would resonate very differently because it's no longer just um, an intellectual curiosity or a creative pursuit. It's actually about the work of trying to feel something with people. Like it's held in a duty of care. Like it felt like a duty for you. And at least my perception, having not ever spoken to you about it, but it, it really was tremendous. Like you should be very, very proud of that show. Thank you. Um, it, it definitely felt like a duty. You know, I was, I was, um, I'd love to turn to Brendan to give him a chance to respond to the question. But um, before I do, you know, I was talking a lot about what the exhibition can't do in the space of building it and reminding people that it was just an exhibition, you know? Um, and I think that was part of it too, was really anchoring the, the the reach and the ambition because everyone wanted to do this, that was working to do this. Um, it was realizing that, you know, what's what's possible is is quite limited, but within that space, we can be really expansive. Thank you for that. And I, I love the idea of, of making the space expansive. And I think that the space sometimes becomes so monolithic, right? And within, again, thinking about what Dina said that, you know, like, do your work, you know, like um, read a book. I think that's really important. Um, and I think that, you know, initially my <clears throat> first reaction to Sam's question was like, you know, you know, ask questions back, you know, um, you know, tell the narrative. But then I was just like, well, I don't always want to be doing the work then. You know, I, I also expect others to be putting it in. And so um, I think that in the position that we're in currently, it's that, you know, students of color, um, you know, are, are, are doing the work for others and they need to, you know, step back and also then give responsibility. So we're going back to this notion of responsibility that, you know, in our, our meetings we've been talking about, it's like, so how do we put that ownership onto somebody to say that there isn't, you know, this oneness. And I think this is again, where, you know, you know, the systems of, 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 you know, of trauma, but also the systems of institution are still seeing things within a hegemony. We're still seeing things in the space that, you know, is inclusive of a certain, but not another. And so where people are in the space, but we're trying to make them feel that they are, they have to kind of form into this one kind of like mold of being, um, whether it's being an artist or a curator. And so when we change those forms, you know, it then complicates things and asks people to understand things in a different way. But that is what we have to do because, you know, we often said our formations of, of identity, our formations of, of who we are come from, you know, multiple spaces, multiple identities. You know, I am, you know, a Kenyan Indian Canadian with the name of Brendan Fernandez, but I also am a punk rocker and a ballet dancer. So my, my, my identities come also from being from my subcultures. And so I think we need to recognize those things and, and the powers that those things together can bring. And then to kind of create that, you know, multiple kind of, you know, hybrid formation um, that this space, this institution should also be allowing it to have its, its, um, its, um, its resonance. I wish that I could just carry, like we could just be a posse that goes to each other's settings to like support one another in these moments. Cause I, you know, everything that you're saying reson, I mean, everybody across the board has kind of resonated and touched upon not only a key frustration, but also like the strength and support of what it means to know that your answer to that silence isn't coming from nowhere. And to know that like, you're not crazy, right? Cause in those settings, like there's a tendency to feel gaslit, like to be able to speak from a position to be like, read a book, right? <laughs> or like, like I have to learn multiple languages to be able to survive in these institutions. Like you should have to do that as well. And it, it can feel very kind of isolating and lonely 
to be on uh, on the hills that we're on to be able to speak from that position and i just hope that anybody who's hearing this like who resonates with those answers like carries nancy and allison and dina and brendan like the, your voices with them right in those settings um i think that like Please. I was just going to jump in. I didn't mean to interrupt, but oh. one of the things I was thinking about as people were talking is the power of just truth telling, which is saying, I do not know. I do not know. And why do we live in a society where you cannot say that? Um, I did some studies with a cognitive scientist and we are findings where the best you can do is just admit, you know, nothing and then ask questions and, 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 Brendan, I'm hearing you about that. That can be weary for an artist to have to like constantly justify. But, you know, let's think about the models that we have in museums. Most people are still using that visual thinking strategy, right? Where you look at an inert piece of art and you say, what do you see? And what makes you say that? And so we've trained a whole generation. I mean, this is going to take 20 years for us to get on the other side of at least to be able to say, I have authority to break down any work just from how it looks visually. I got that. I can do that. And, and it's so unsatisfying and it's so unjust because it doesn't even give us what's supposed to be going on in that transaction. So I, I'm a big advocate of let's just break down what's happening in those galleries, people, you know, because teaching children that they can own a narrative, I think is not the direction we want to go in. absolutely marking your limits um i want to i have another kind of direction but i wanted to kind of pause to see if there are any areas that maybe you all wanted to speak to each other you know we're not in a physical space together but i think we can embody that moving forward i definitely have a ton of places we could go but i want to take the pause to maybe give room for that Should I keep steering this the ship? Great. Okay, fantastic. Um, one of the kinds of areas that I'm interested in in maybe unpacking a little bit around this question of responsibility is we've we've talked about you know the relationship between kind of um, you know responsibility and accountability in general terms, but I'm wondering because there seems to be in the air this question of accountability right like that institutions have to be held accountable to their histories and to the the violences and you know both um spectacular and more quotidian or more everyday that that institutions tend to promote um and i'm wondering you know if maybe we can speak or if maybe you all can reflect upon um, the scale or the relationship of responsibility, which, which for me, you know, um, in the spirit of this panel, one of the ways that that term came up was actually, Dina, and something that you said around, um, not to put you on the spot, but around the way that we, that you framed in, in um, your presentation as well, right, that like we, when we're in these positions, we have a certain amount of responsibility. And I'm wondering if maybe you can, or we can all reflect on the ways that as individuals in these positions, we balance um, the things that we're responsible for in our own processes. I think Allison, you've detailed that, you know, so poetically in the way that you manage that with the Breonna Taylor show. Um, and Brendan, you talked about activating like a community around a very specific investment in like a public, um intervention in a space that can be coded as super violent right to like enter or inject a little bit of a counter pleasure or um a movement that isn't um grounded in violence maybe um or violence in the state way not in the counter way um so i'm wondering maybe we can talk a little bit about how we balance our positions right in between both being responsible to and and perhaps accountable to the publics and communities and loved ones that we um 
are in conversation with, with these larger kind of more dominant structures that seem to be weighing down on us that we want accountability from. Um, so there, you know, if you can talk out loud about some of the challenges with that, but maybe another direction we can go is like, where do you source energy from to keep doing that work? right? Which can feel super draining at times um, when you're in these positions. Like what turns you on? What excites you? Where do you get the, the kind of, yeah, the energy or the resources to keep going in that balance between responsibility and accountability? I think those things go hand in hand, the responsibility and the accountability. I don't think they're always easy to do at the same time. And I think oftentimes I forget about one in lieu of the other, but at my best, I can hold both. I can hold the responsibility I have, which means I am accountable to someone. And I can also try to kind of punch up and understand where there's another layer of structure above me or around me that I might wanna to push to be held accountable. It's not easy and it can feel really scary, but it's nice to hold both. The mistake I made in my early career was to focus more on accountability than responsibility. And I think it was really eye-opening to hold that like, oh shit, no girl, like you have power in this space now too. And like, what, how, how are you now thinking about that quite differently? And I think Nancy, your advice to just say you do not know is really helpful. And I think really helps people hold that tension or at least helps me uh, the times that I'm brave enough to say that thing, or uh, I'm sorry or, um, you know, like just things that make that tension between accountability and responsibility. And then I think to your point about what gives you energy, I mean, it's been really important, especially this last year to, to really cultivate things outside of my job. Um, like I get a lot of energy outside of this field and for a long time, I didn't have that. And so it just felt like a cycle of being really uh, energized by this field and then drained by it, energized and then drained by it, energized. It was just this like, Oof. But now I feel like I can turn away from my job, which is what this, these are a lot, you know, jobs we love, but they are jobs um, and cultivate things that can bring energy far away from the social network that is this, this work. Yeah, I am super similar uh, to what Dina was going to say. I think the responsibility and accountability go together and it's hand in hand. And when I think about, you know, you know, just the way that I make work, you know, as a dance maker, you know, we're about collectivity, we're about being together in the same space. And that sometimes, you know, when it, you know, we have to breathe together, we have to like move together. But like also within my process, it's also about like, let's come have a conversation. Let's, 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 let's collaborate within our collectivity. Let's find out, you know, from each other in the space, how do we do things? And that's not the typical way dance is made specifically in, in a choreographed way when it's about rules and, and you have to do it one way when it's about ballet and so I think a lot about just my process as a maker comes from a space of being with others in community in collectivity in collaboration which are very generous kind spaces and that for me is is a very important way of how to make when I'm when I'm when I'm making movements but I really start thinking about you know this this idea of energy and again the cycle uh when we're moving as dancers that's labor that's that's physical labor that we make we we, we show it in an effortless way but you know there is definitely this idea of energy through stopping not doing anything um breathing and I think that that's something that, you know, again, goes with the kind of idea of silence. You know, I think these things are really important spaces. So the idea of, of stopping and giving yourself a chance to disengage um, allows for a very important space where, you know, after when you come back into the space again, you know, the cycle can start to move in a different way when you have that, 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 that distance from something. And I think that's a really important um, idea of, uh, again, to be kind, to be self you know, giving to yourself, and then you can give back to others. I think that's a very important thing. Once you give to yourself, then it can spread back to others. And I think that's something that I've really been, been, you know, pushing throughout my practice, but really trying to focus on right now, that once I can give to me, I can give back to others. Kimberly, do you want to go or have me jump in? 
Oh, I'm sorry, Allison. I'm gonna go. Um, okay, so I love this conversation that we're having, the scale of responsibility. And um, I've got to say, during the pandemic, I listened a lot to Arts Equity, that group Arts Equity. They were very helpful for me. They had sessions where we would breathe and sing and all kinds of things. Um, and one tool I learned from that was the sphere of influence. So that I am comfortable instead of saying, like, I've got to change the dominant structure. I've become comfortable in saying, what is my sphere of influence? You know, what, what can I do within my world um, rather than me feeling like, um, you know, the good fight. I've, I've got a little narrative on the good fight and how, uh, just like Dana, you were saying, you know, that's a trope. That's actually a tool that's negative. The good fight is, is a tool that I think has been used against um, folks from marginalized communities. So one of the things that I started doing after learning about sphere of influence is that when I was asked to do anything, I would always negotiate to bring a student in. Um, so today's a little different because there's so many of us. I think a student would be just one more person. But if I'm doing a talk solo, then I'll say, I want a student. And typically the arts institution will say, oh, we don't have money for it. And my response is always like, I, I think you do. <laughs> And unless I have the student, I'm not going to do the gig. And so it's a new muscle for me to be able to exercise. But I think we should all be doing more of this. Just like you want me, here's what I need. And, and so mentorship for me is my sphere of influence. You know, I'm, I'm really, I don't have to see it myself. It doesn't have to be me. It's not about me. But if I can't convince students that this is worthy as a career, you know, that this is worth every sacrifice they're making to enter into, right, then why am I doing what I'm doing? I'm part of the problem. And so this, this you know, stopping and demanding something that I need, I, I think is a way that, yes, we enact power, but how do we change the big institution? It's our level of participation. How do we manage that? I think that's really smart, Nancy. And, you know, I, I, I feel that I'm in this place right now where I'm constantly negotiating and real really renegotiating the space between like, and the relationship between accountability and responsibility and who am I accountable to and what am I responsible for? And um, on, the, on the point of mentorship, you know, whenever I'm working with a, a more junior colleague or um, a curator just starting out, um, I try to explain that those it's ever changing, right? Like we are, we are curators. When I say we, I mean curators are really responsible for um, dynamic exchanges within and amongst many different kinds of people and many different kinds of places. And I think that the most challenging position sometimes I find myself in is trying to understand, understand, negotiate, and renegotiate. Like, if I make this decision, how does it impact an artist and or a person who's going to come see the work and or my colleagues and or the reputation of an institution? And I, I feel that that's kind of a cycle of thinking that I'm never going to be able to relieve myself from um, because it is a constant, it requires a constant awareness. And I've made major mistakes thinking that I was making the right choice. Um, I feel that that's also something we should name, like mistakes are going to happen. Um, you know, in, in this kind of work, um, there are, you're not going to please everybody. Um, in this kind of work, you know, even if you're negotiating the space between accountability and responsibility to whom and to what, as long as, I, I wanna impart that as long as you kind of keep your North Star, if like, this is the work that I do. This is why I'm doing it. I need to check in with myself on all of these things. Um, you can accept when you do fail um, in the same ways that you can accept when you do succeed. And I think that all of those together are learning opportunities. Thank you, Allison. That it's like we're you're in my brain because <laughs> one of the kinds of um, one direction I was wondering if we could go is, and you know, of course I'm like making a big leap here. So I'm happy for you all to resist this question as you want to, um, or like answer the question you want, you wanted to hear versus the question you hear, which is like what, you know, us academics are really good at doing. Um, I was just, you know, hearing 
hearing our conversation so far, I'm wondering if we can even touch down on uh, maybe a specific challenge, right, that we've had to encounter as of late, or and maybe it's not a recent challenge, right? Maybe it's a challenge that we've encountered early on in our work. Um, and yeah, just as an opportunity to maybe think through how we've learned from those challenges or maybe like refuse to learn from those challenges. Because I think, you know, one area that feels really hard when we're, well, at least I'll, I'll speak for myself, like, in early on in this endeavor that I took on as a life choice, um, I actually was very like idealistic, Dina, to your point about like, I'll just make work my, like work being my life is no big deal, right? Like I'll just like always do this. And I'm so happy to work like 20 hours a day and seven days a week and, I'll say yes to everything and everything is a chance to like engage with new people. And I do think that one of the ways that that framework operates, I think this is a consequence of, you know, the blurring of art and life that we so romanticize in the field that like one of the consequences is actually we don't have an opportunity to reflect on the challenges that come up and we kind of railroad through them or we find it very hard to, to create a space to be like, I wish that this thing, um, yeah, I, or not even I wish, but just like, this is what I'm taking away from this specific challenge of my life, right? Like if I could go back 10 years, I would be like, hey, maybe you should not actually spend seven days a week working like just in a really flat way and that doesn't make you that doesn't make the opportunities in your life any smaller that doesn't mean that like you're not going to get the next thing because you're so you know focused on upholding that boundary um but there was no we were all doing it you know me and like all of my people were doing it and nobody was telling us like it, you don't have to grind like that. Like there are people doing far less and getting far more. And how do we, you know, how can we kind of preserve our energies to like focus? I love this, Allison, on like that North Star, right? Like what is the ultimate thing that's guiding us? So in the spirit of that, I'm wondering if maybe anybody would like to kind of touch down on a challenge in their work and um, some of the kinds of takeaways or lessons that they've that they carry on to today. Uh, yeah, I can speak a little bit to it. You know, again, you know, just the challenge of being together uh, was a big thing for me in my practice in the last little while, um, because, and, and as I said, you know, it is about collective movements, it's about creating criti critical mass. And when, you know, the pandemic began, I was like, I, how do we do this? How do I create solidarity? How do I create uh, um, a space for inclusivity when we can't even be together? So that was something that was very, you know, complicated. But then I started thinking about, you know, the ways that I was kind of communicating or being with people through this, this virtual space that is still our, our reality. It's, you know, this grid space, this safe space, this screen space. And so I started making work digitally through the the parameters of something like zoom um which actually became a material for me and so i think that again for me that was just also a moment to kind of stop and think that you know it, there's a sense of resilience that you have to kind of again rethink things find ways to do it um in in all moments of challenge um, but then also for me the pandemic gave me space to to as i said stop to 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 be re-energized to kind of start writing to start thinking you know you know, talking to more people, like having those those interactions that allowed me to then kind of generate new thoughts and new beginnings and that that and now slowly are being able to, you know, fruition into um, things, you know, still complicated what those things are, but also being accepting, being accepting that that there is change that, you know, that was something that I was trying to really kind of um, reconcile with a lot of people that, you know, there is, this is going to be a different space, a different world, and we have to allow that change as much as it seems unknowing, scared, um, you know, fearful, that in that we have to kind of like 
allow ourselves to kind of maneuver in that space. And so, you know, it's something that, and I think because of, you know, we talked about, you know, you know, people who have marginalized come from different, you know, many narratives, adaptability is something that's really important and something that I have had to do it, deal with, you know, throughout my life. And so this allowed for another moment of being adaptable. And so those are things that I, 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 I give to, you know, you know, young artists, as I talk to them about this moment of, of, of finding newness, but also being adaptable and allowing change to still be something that even in moments of, of, of fearfulness, of unknowingness, that they can still become, you know, very important tools to understand, to learn, to, but also to kind of produce and make as well through. One of my challenges right now is um, uh, that I feel a tremendous responsibility at Mellon um, to move really quickly, which is important. And I respect our leadership tremendously for that choice um, because the problems are so scary right now, have been, but especially at this last year, just the urgency by which we are trying to move so many resources as quickly as possible. Um, and one of the challenges of that is just uh, really being able to sleep at night, knowing that we there's nothing that we just cannot move at that scale. Like the scale of what we are trying to solve in this country, in this world, is so massive that it could take. I mean, it's just like we can't even dent it. And so, something about really seeing that up close is terrifying, and realizing that like capitalism really cannot solve this mess it made. Like it just can't do it, no matter how hard we want it to. And the other part of that is it does disrupt a little bit this like wanting to cultivate something outside of your job. And so right now I feel a lot more responsible than I do accountable, which means I'm probably missing something, like there's something I'm not hearing. And then in the meantime, it's just like, go, 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 go. And I wonder if that feeling will lift eventually. So it's more a personal challenge. And I think if I'm listening to my mentors enough, it just feels like this will happen in waves that there will just be moments where the work calls for something that you might just have to put a lot of your own, your own personal joys and values on the line to get it done. Um, but it's the first time I've like really felt that. Like I can't, I can't move at the pace of the issues that we're trying to solve. Yeah, I'm glad we're having this discussion about labor. And, you know, I think it's been exposed how the arts are one of those industries that will really exploit our labor, um, you know, based off of all kinds of odd justifications dealing with, you know, we're so passionate, this is what we want to do, you know, it's for their communities. And, and of course, people take advantage of that. And it, in answering your question about what's a mistake that I've made, um, I see a lot of institutions doing what I call like a mission drift you know, the, you're in philanthropy, you guys know this, like, you know, you're, what you're about has changed because you want to meet the money, right? But this is a type of mission drift where I'm brought into a project and I'm only gonna be doing this part, but then, oh, it's open to this part. Oh, and we, can we add on this part? And then all of a sudden, you know, like it's expanded and um, the amount of labor that I'm spending is way outside the bounds of what, was initially presented, but typically I'm already in with both feet because there's an artist or there's a deadline or there's a catalog or there's a half finished essay, you know, and like you're already fully in. And so for our students in the line, I mean, what I would like to see that we develop is some standardization of fees, hours. I think Canada has this often. I've gone to a website, you know, to see, okay, if it's this big on this page and it's a rent of a thousand, how much should an artist get? I mean, to my knowledge, maybe this group can tell me, like, do we have an easy resource like that? You know, what is our labor worth? You know, could we standardize that? Someone out there fix that thing for us so, so, so that we're not taken advantage of and we actually have contracts that reflect our labor um, because, because I find that it's just endless. And, and once you're in the machine, then you're, you know, fully being pulled along at a speed that's not your own. So I don't know if other people have experienced that, but. I mean, there's wage guidelines that, um, I don't know if you know about that website, Wage for Work, I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, that sets good guidelines for funding working within, working with museums based on operating budgets um, and kind of what participation 
Um, I just want to quickly say, Brendan, before you jump back in, is that one of the things I'm struggling with right now is that we haven't learned anything from the time that we all spent um, not coming together. And I feel I'm really struggling with the pace, to Dina's point, um, but also like, why are we producing at such a rate? Why are we yeah. returning to a way of working that feels like we're right back at it? Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I agree. And I, and I think that transition should be taken like with in process and slowly. Um, but, you know, I think today um, I even just said to myself, I was like, I wish we were not, I wasn't doing so much um, because it was just this kind of constant like back and forth. And I'm like, we're back in it. And I was like, and I was like, I don't want this still. But again, thinking about like, you know, labor and wages and wages amazing but in Canada Carfac has been doing this for years um, as a process and wages based on Carfac and um, and you know and I think that that's something that's really interesting because I think our ways of, of tell, asking and telling you know even within our institutions and our schools is to produce objects to produce things where you know there's a different I difference when you're producing ideas as an artist versus producing like objects because you know we think about the commodification of art in America it's very much about an exchange. You, you produce an object and then that object has a value where, you know, artists that are more experimental or artists that are working within the, the spaces of, um, you know, like, you know, concept it, or it doesn't, or in non-traditional materials, um, it, it has a different uh, value in terms of, because it can be commodified, it might be ephemeral. But so I also, I think about that, but then I also think about, you know, you know social money within spaces. Social money um, isn't, you know, I, I get my students ask me like, which, what grants can I apply to? You know, it's like, well, these ones are all nominated based. You know, it's like in, in and I'm speaking specifically as a Canadian uh, as well, that, you know, there is public money that allows artists to kind of find ways to, 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 to build their careers, which then changes the practice. It definitely changes the way that art artists make. Um, um, and there's, it's more complicated than that because sometimes it also becomes for me a little bit too insular within the system, but there is that system of support in certain governments. Even think about Scandinavia um, and their, their systems to support and, and um, allow their artists to, to create. Can I ask while we're here, like why do we think the world snapped back so fast? Like, so for philanthropy, we, we didn't just snap back, we like snap back and then added 10 decibels of speed. And the rationale is people are struggling, we gotta go, right? Like, so that's, I, I completely understand the frame, but to just echo Allison's thing, like I, I meditate on it, that like moment, I don't remember when, but that moment where I was like, ah, maybe this is finally the thing that like undoes this whole system. And you're right, it just snapped back so hard. And from my view, it's not servicing anybody. Like curators are frustrated, artists are frustrated, academics are frustrated, students, schools, like, audiences can't keep up. So why do, why do we think that's happening? I think it's happening because, you know, stopping when, even when we, when, when, when we started the pandemic and we had to like things started closing, it was about economic loss and snapping back is, you know, when you're, when you're being still or silent or being, you're being idle, you're wasting time. And within capitalist systems, you know, you have to keep be producing, you know, time, you know, time is money. And so the snapback was that as we keep stopping, we're, wasting we're wasting away we're not building within this the system um which again is not a system that is supportive of individuals it's um i mean collectives it's it's supporting individuals and so i think that's why we had to snap back it's a great question i mean i think in general people are fearful right you know there's a, a we, we've been, and, and of course we all know that this is a point at which um, cultures get exploited once again, right? You know, this narrative of, of poverty and, and of, of time, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism that has been, I think, used against people's, you know, empowerment. And so I think we're, we're just seeing the same tune. Yeah. Yeah, Dina. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say, just to follow up to what Brendan said, I appreciate you mentioning like differentiating between an art object and labor itself. Um, like whether an, an, an artist's intellectual work is something that should be um, paid for 
And I would agree that it absolutely should be. Um, but it's such a distinction that, and you, you saw that out so perfectly, I hadn't thought about it in that way, that it's really object driven. Um, I'm curious how you navigate that as it, within the space of performance. It's, it's complicated. And that's why I think for artists, you know, or like who make ephemeral work, we have to like find those grants and, um, you know, and find philanthropy in, in this country. Um, Cause it is, it is very complicated. Cause even then in the space of collect collections, right. You know, museums collect objects, but they don't know how to collect performance. And that's something that I've been working with many museums to try to have conversation about those narratives. And, you know, and that was something that was complicated because like, I will now, um, maybe this is going into too much detail, like, you know, post pandemic, like, you know, I had shows lined up after, before the Whitney Biennial. So the year of 2020 was supposed to be a robust year and museums were gonna pay fees or galleries were gonna pay fees. But then when the pandemic happened, everything was canceled and there was nothing to say I would, would be supported through like, uh, you know, a cancel fee or something. So I started thinking now like a lot through contracts and how I have to protect myself. And I think that's something also as artists need to do is how do we protect ourselves? Because, and so, and it's, it, and, and I'm still trying to figure out this whole process, you know, but I'm doing it from, again, the mistake of not knowing this. And now like, I'll put that clause in into a performance that if it does get canceled for some reason that I should get paid because I was saying to the museum, it's not that day that I'm in space doing my performance. It also comes from the time beforehand where I'm conceptualizing, thinking through it, training. You know, one of the biggest things for me in the pandemic was losing income for my dancers because they are, I'm responsible. You know, we're getting back to responsible. I'm responsible to take care. They're, you know, they're, they're living objects in my work that give me their mind, body, and soul. Their physicality is my work. And so, you know, even now, like sometimes I'm just taking interesting, you know, creation processes with them on Zoom or things just so that I can give, get them that, that fee paid for. Um, so it's just been a really interesting thing to maneuver um, and document, but again, protection is really important. And I think something like Carfax or wage is important because it creates like a, a, a space of protection between um, you know, the institutions and saying like, you need to pay artists. Like that's the thing, like pay artists. <laughs> it seems simple, but it doesn't always happen. Absolutely. You know, I think one of the, I'm going to transition us into some questions from the audience. Um, one of the kinds of things that I'm really um, touched by and like really need to, I'm, I moved to really re, recenter in conversations across the board is the ways that like, on the one hand, right, um, a lot of, we, Oh, it's very convenient to not think about what we do as work um, because there are so many other investments like fueling that, right? Whether it's um, a certain kind of commitment to um, a thought or a politic or a practice, or it's a creative drive that has all sorts of attachments, right? We've, we are unfortunately or fortunately or unfortunately live in a context that exploits that attachment, right? That a political or sentimental or emotional attachment to the work that we do. And it's so important and crucial to center and to return to this idea that it is work. And as labor and as work, right? It, it could be a labor of love as much as it can be a labor that needs to pay the bills and keep the lights on, right? Um, central to that is this other kind of, uh, you know, I'm hoping anybody in positions of relatively more power than us are hearing is that like artists and curators and, you know, academics and cultural workers across the board need to be at the table in making a lot of these decisions to your point, right? That like the labor is so much more than the event or the object. It's so much more than the occasion, right? Um, it, it's about thinking holistically around more equitable systems of accounting for, um, uh, for that work, you know, um, outside of the time clock that governs it. It's so much more than that. Um, I know I have questions, so I should get to them or else I could just like go into this. I'm like, is, are we in the five o'clock hour where we get to have a cocktail and really 
get into some of these questions. But here we go. I'm going to start with this first question, which is for Dina. Um, and I'm going to read it just verbatim. I really liked what you said about getting energy from outside of our jobs and cultivating relationships and lives outside of this. I wonder if you could speak about how this could be possible for young artists, curators, etc. There's always the challenge or the need to establish oneself in the field early so that one can make the dis this distance between personal and professional lives later in life. But how do we take care of our own health and well being in the process of establishing oneself in these broader worlds or contexts? Yeah, I don't have an answer to that because I, that's exactly what I did. So I spent a majority of my early career not having any clear boundaries or respecting my health and wellness. And this is something I'm just starting to really hold. So I sadly, and I'm sorry, I don't have any advice. Um, I will say that there will always be another thing, like it, my sense at least is at a certain point, you really can start to say no to things. And I think maybe Nancy, you named that earlier, this pressure to say yes to everything. And like, that doesn't need to be the case, but I don't know yet. This is an industry, unfortunately, that is really built on like trying to establish yourself at a very specific time period. And I don't know if any of my colleagues have any salient advice for that, but I regret it. Looking back on it now, I regret it. And I'm now learning a new muscle, which is to establish a boundary around myself. Um, so yeah, I got the jobs I wanted, but I lost things that were considerably, I think more important to me along the way. I hope your generation does not have to do that forever. Yeah, I so appreciate um, all of you and just our candid conversation here about you know how to move in this space. And, and um, I was thinking if that's from a student, one of the things that I see through time as I age is that my students are their best own networks with each other. And so rather than kind of thinking kind of horizontally of, I, you know, I should have this job with this important person who might be able to help me do this thing or that thing. You know, I see just a lot of power with, um, you know, who, who are you going to school with? Who's your neighbor? Who are you making work with? You know, like create your own collaborative space and, and just start moving it. You know, I, here in uh, California, I, I, I was able to teach at CalArts a bit, you know, and, and those guys were always putting up art and garages and homes and, you know, happenings and things. And so I, I think it's not apparent when you're doing that, but you, you're you creating a system, a web of resources that you're going to depend upon 30 years down the road, right? You know, you're, you're going to, one of you will be at a museum. One of you will, you know, be a curator. One of you will be an artist and, and just, you know, know that that time that you're spending building your practice, you're, you're also spending and investing in people that hopefully will stay with you. Okay, I'm going to pivot to um, maybe a question that one of our very own Allison would like to bring to the group in terms of um, this term anti-racist specifically. And um, Allison, I don't want to speak on behalf of you. Do you want to maybe frame it a little bit or open it up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just, I feel like oftentimes we can get so stuck in the space of using uh, a phrase or jargon or language, especially in the, in the field. Um, and so I, I'm always trying to unpack and understand where and how op language operates um, for certain people. And that's part of like me understanding where people are coming from and how they interpret, you know, the moves that are made in the gallery space or otherwise. And so the question I have is, and I'm really not sure I have an answer to this. So I guess it's a little unfair, but the question is like, how do you define the anti-racist? Like what is, what is, um, what does that look like in practice? And, and how do you in, interpret it, I guess, in, in, in defining it? So I just want to ask fellow panelists, Sam, I also want to ask you um, just your thoughts. I think being an anti-racist is acknowledging that race exists, that racism exists. That's it. It's just like really leaning in to the possibility 
that the conditions of one's race will affect how they are allowed to succeed and or fail in this country. Um, and I do want to name because I can't I can't help it a little bit. There's a question in the in the chat. There's a white audience member who is really struggling with this conversation. And I just want to, if I if I may break the fourth wall on that a little bit, feeling like this conversation has reduced them to be someone who is filled with blanks. And I really, I cannot caution enough how much that is not the point of this conversation. But that read on this conversation is probably why we have to be having it. Um, which is just to say that there is a carelessness to how we don't think about race in this country or think about protecting whiteness in this country. That is, I don't have a much more formed thought on that, but it's what I think of when I think of anti-racism, which also, if I may add, is a terrible term. Like it's just a terrible term, but if we are to have it, I think it's just like, can we, can we have the conversation from a place of race? And a lot of people are resistant or they have conversations about race from a place of themselves. And that's, I think where we get like kind of stuck. Great question, Allison. Thank you for putting this in front of us. You know, I'm, I'm trained in anthropology and of course an anthropologist will say, well, you know, technically race does not exist. Right, race is a social construct. I don't think that that is, it helps in these moments that, that we're engaged with, that we're talking about now, just to dismiss it because we, we know it exists in practice. Um, I, I, I have to admit, I, I feel like maybe the others who have spoken that it's an awkward term. I'm not sure it's one that I would choose. Um, and again, I don't want to waste time on, on just uh, terminology, right? I mean, these aren't just words, but you know, I, I think maybe what people are, are seeking, what they're hungry for, and I know they are, is, is, a, is a fix it. Like it's not an anti it, it's a fix it. <laughs> and they want it quickly. You know, I teach large classes of students. I teach race and representation and hands down, all those students want to fix it quickly. They want to know like how to get through this. And I, I, I think it's frustrating to, to tell them like, you know, we're, we're not doing that in this class. We're not fixing the thing because that, you know, is, is, is first of all, one person, one institution can't do that. And, and second of all, we're, we're actually just trying to build other thought processes that you can mobilize, right? This is not about fixing something. This is about becoming competent culturally about thinking of new ideas you haven't thought about before. You know, again, it's, it's that thing of ignorance. We, we live in a society that has to have an opinion. And, and, and our students are learning this too. You know, they're, they're blogging, they're tweeting, they have opinions. And, and, and my job as an educator is to ask like, where did that opinion come from? How do you support that opinion? Who has authority to speak? You know, I, I think that's where we're sitting right now. And, and anti-racism to me is, is it, it connotes to me a fix it. Yeah, and I also think that this, again, you know, again the term anti, you know, bringing that a sort of places as like one or the other, right? And I don't think it is that, you know, it's not a black and white situation, again, one or the other. I think those are the binaries. Those are the ways that we create separation and fracture. So kind of going back to how I began speaking in the beginning of this, of this conversation, but I think sameness is important to realize that we are the same. We are bodies that breathe and live and together we can find each other to say that, yes, I am living, breathing. So I think sameness is important for, as, a, as, a, as a way to sort of like think through that term, bodies, embodiment, living, breathing together. Um, I know we're kind of wrapping up here. And so I wanted to kind of give pause. I could talk about that term for so long. I'm such an inheritor of the kind of activist and organizer um, history of that term. Um, but I, you know, I also kind of, Dina, in that spirit of like acknowledging difference, right? Like just like acknowledging racial difference feels like it's such a barrier um, in order to get to the place, Brendan, that you're talking about to like, to be able to move through that difference so that we actually understand that our future and that our well-being is dependent on um, a certain kind of activation around that difference. And it's, it's dependent on, um, on others who, who we don't know, right? Like who have no kind of responsibility to us. I think um, one of the things that, that um, moving 
moving us through this conversation that's really struck me is like we, all all of you as panelists it's not it's like a seamless almost organic understanding that like your well-being and your position that you hold is is because of a history that brought you there but be, you know a community a genealogy an inheritance that brought you to that position and it's not a threat or a danger or a certain kind of like questioning of your of your personhood to acknowledge that like you're there because of other people and that you want to continue that tradition right like to work on behalf of, to act as stewards of, to um, be facilitators for uh, experiences and voices and, and modes of living that are outside of you. And so often we think of that as a competing investment or often institutions kind of like tend to pit us against each other in this scarcity model of like, there can only be one, right? And and we've and and you all personally, I should say, have have um, represent for me models of living, models of working, models of being that aim to undo that. And so, like, I personally want to thank you for the work that you do in 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 not thinking of racial difference as something to um, to surpass or work against, but actually as something that like unites us and brings us together in a different form of being um, to make work that is, you know, generating something outside of our own, outside of reproducing our own experiences in the world, which is what got us in this mess in the first place, right? Like in this normative, um, in this way that, that rewards normativity, racially, sexually, gen in a gendered way. So um, with that, I just want to thank you all for the work that you do and for the time that you've given us today. Um, thank you to everybody out there in the ether. Stay tuned for our third installment of this series, which will have a more kind of international and, and hopefully internationalist approach to some of these questions. And with that, I, I leave you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, panelists.